Um, I'd like to welcome my my panelists this morning, and in a short while, I'll just introduce, uh, or they'll they'll introduce themselves. And more importantly, I'd like to welcome you to today's session, all about building uh, the road to to you know more resilient primary education. So, uh, without further ado, what I'd like to do is I'd like my colleagues to introduce themselves, and then we will crack on. Uh, Giles, why don't we start with you? Hi. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Giles Hill. I'm the digital learning lead for a group of 28 primary schools down here in Cornwall. I've um, been running CPD for primary schools for a number of years, um, and we pride ourselves in having quite a practical, realistic approach to technology um, and hope that primary schools will be able to push forward in that way over the coming years. Thanks very much, Giles. Andrew, why don't I come to you next? Hi all, um, I'm Andrew Yeomans. I'm an Associate Executive Principal at Delta Trust. We're a large trust in the north, um, 52 academies, um, 33 primaries, 16 secondaries, um, three alternate provisions. Um, I am the remote learning lead for the trust uh, um, and we pride ourselves on a learning centred approach to remote learning. Good to see you all. Fantastic, thank you very much Andrew. And, and, and last but not least, Harpre. Can I ask you to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Harpreet and I am a maths lead at Reach Academy in West London. So um, I'm mainly in the classroom, but I was heavily involved during the lockdown in producing content for remote learning for Oak National Academy. So I've had a lot of CPD for from Oak National Academy um, on remote teaching and how to use online platforms to their um, to the most effective way and for the communities that we're serving. Um, so considering all the barriers, et cetera, and how it can fit um, the setting that you're in. So I'm really excited to be here today and learn a lot from everyone else. Oh, thank you very much, Harpreet. Harpreet, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start and, and, and lean into something with you uh, for a moment. And this is just what we were talking about offline. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously, you know, quite a lot of discussion at the moment from schools that are coming to the demonstrator program that are looking for support that feel they're at the very earliest of stages in terms of their development. Um, and I'm, I'm keen for you to maybe share Reach Academy's journey because, um, you know, we know that, you know, it, it's it wasn't too long ago that you were in quite a same, the similar position as to some of the schools that, that, that are coming to the program for support today. So maybe you could just talk for a couple of minutes about yeah, what, what your, your journey and experience has been. Yes, um, so I yeah, I definitely agree that we were um, very early in our stages in terms of providing learning um, using Google Classroom. So that's what we've um, put most of our time into, but we saw that there was a lot of inconsistencies across the school. We felt that the secondary part of the school was using it more regularly than the primary was, for example. Um, some people were choosing to post on Google Classroom, some were handing out worksheets. So there wasn't a consistent approach. So the first thing we had to do is increase staff confidence in using these platforms. And the lockdown accelerated this and really made it obvious that there were inconsistencies. So what we did is create a lot of how to videos using platforms like Zoom and Loom, where you can record yourself and share your screen and show uh, staff how to use Google Classroom and um, have a really consistent approach in how we even you know some small details in terms of how do you post, who's posted it, what date did they post, and what subject is it? It's very specific, so that it's really consistent across the school. Um, especially when you're thinking about the user-friendly experience on the other side for the children and the parents. So we ha we had to train the staff first, and we found those how-to videos really useful. Then the second thing we thought about um, improving was actually the children and the parents' confidence in using Google Classroom at home. And again, um, before lockdown, we did Google Classroom um, how to workshops, but during lockdown, we then did how to videos, but again, showing sharing the screen, but doing it for the children and the parents. And we found that really useful because that removed a lot of the barriers that children have, which is, I don't know where this is. I don't know how to use this. I can't find this. So it's just showing them a, a tutorial. So we found using platforms for tutorials really beneficial for really high effective CPD but also um, to ensure there's no access issues for the children and the parents. Um, I mentioned before that it's really about being consistent so 
in order to have that consistency, you need to have buy-in from everyone. So that's why we focus really heavily on the staff in school, but also the children and the parents at home. And then um, another thing we found um, really useful is uh, thinking about these platforms. How can we uh, provide the par parents and the children who don't have access to the uh, devices? What can we do? So as a school, we luckily had resources in school, lots of Chromebooks. So we just had a really clear plan of how we were going to share them with families, how we can target families who have more than one sibling in the school. Etc. So that was, you know, a, on a bigger vision um, level of how we're going to make sure that we remove the biggest barrier, which is access to devices. But it, this has been a, you know, very long journey. But actually, we found that the lockdown accelerated it because we realised there was a need, and it was um, really important that we address that as soon as possible. Yeah, it seems to, it's definitely forced a lot of hands, right? Uh, that mm -hmm. you know, haven't necessarily thought that. Uh, you know, ha having a better sort of digital infrastructure in place, um, you know, was should have been prioritised up until this point. Mm -hmm. um, Giles and Andrew, I, I want, want to sort of dovetail off of that uh, point and just sort of talk about, you know, what, what are these sort of building blocks that make for effective hybrid learning? I mean, uh, Harpreet's talked a little bit about, you know, we need everybody to be on board in terms of staff and then, you know, training for both pupils and parents in, in your experiences um, from say down down in the southwest Giles what, what maybe you could talk us about a little bit about the building blocks and the journey that you've sort of seen evolve um, from from all of your work okay so um, you know fairly early on we had to make some choices in terms of the platforms that we were going to advise our 28 schools would look to to use and because we're quite heavily um, involved in, in using Chromebook as a as a major device. I'm, I'm really pleased with that. Um, we looked to the Google login system and, and um, you know Google Classroom immediately sort of stood out as well. This this makes sense. Um, but we also looked quite carefully um, at other options. We used Tapestry down in reception, um, and and we've also looked at Seesaw and schools, including my the, the school in which I teach. Um, we use Seesaw down in Key Stage 1 and um, actually as that, uh, as the journey has gone, gone on, you just kind of look back at it and you say, right, we had to we had to back these horses, you know, we had to back these products. We look at all of them and actually in primary schools, we look at all of them um, and say, perhaps they're not catered to us. Look at Teams, look at Google Classroom, they come from the business world, they look at the secondary education first. And then so, the, and, and when people look at them, they go, okay, is, is, is that really for us? Um, and so it's actually in quite a difficult position where you've got to choose these building blocks and say, OK, go down, go down this route, work with, you know, talk to the head of school and, and, and let them look at the product and say, OK, I feel comfortable with this one. We had some schools who would look at Seesaw and they, would, they go, that's for us. OK, that's for us. Others who were somewhere in between, like, like us, we would kind of Seesaw Google Classroom uh, and then and then others who went with the standard Google Classroom and then, you know, what are they thinking at the moment? What they think in terms of where they are now? I would say lots of them are thinking, I'm not quite sure we've backed the right horse with that. OK, so it's difficult in terms of building blocks, um, in terms of making those steps. And when I've spoken to schools in through the Demonstrate program recently, I've been more and more inclined to say to them, look, look at the product, think, does it suit your needs and where are you going to? with this and, and you know there's a couple I've spoken to recently they, they 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 really didn't have much there at all in terms of their infrastructure in terms of the hardware in their place and and I wasn't about to say to them look set up your Google system and give your year one children Google logins and off they go because it doesn't work like that yeah and 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 so I, it, it's disappointing. It's, it's it's really disappointing the sort of lack of development towards primaries from a company like Google. But looking back on it, do we, we you know, does it surprise us? Maybe it doesn't surprise us, but it, it's slightly disappointing. And perhaps they've got something up their sleeve further down the line. I, I guess it's like you know, it's difficult to compare apples with pears, right? And we understand the different use cases. I'm, I'm interested to, to understand, Andrew, in your sort of position where you've got 50 plus schools. I mean, that's challenging to cascade um you know con continuity and consistency through all schools right i mean what what 
perhaps can you can you offer to around you know, this idea of building blocks and and how you've tackled those challenges yeah so um i think to start with a clear intention and it certainly comes um, from leadership um but clear underpinning principles that include the parents and staff um of course it needs to be um safe and secure and accessible and we were in a strong position um uh, being well resourced um but what we have is we have cycles of research informed trials um where we can validate impact and refine practice um that leads into sort of regular bite-sized cpd sessions that are around 20 or 30 minutes and actually they are recorded to support accessibility or revisiting um to support confidence um, around staff um but with regards to sort of upskilling people i mean it evolves and it grows through our research trials and experience but it is underpinned by key principles um which ensure that really there is no complete change of direction it, it's growth um and, and this does dovetail with the staff stages of development those bite-sized chunks that confidence that growth um and, and anyone could be involved in those trials um, mm -hmm. everyone's feeding into it part of it contributing and collaborating and that means that we can pull on expertise build capacity um, but the process is very much informed by learning needs it's not inhibited um, by bricks and mortar practice time sales etc um, it, it, we're, we're, we're very aware of sustained engagement um, and the accessibility and continued access um, by pupils um, and 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 really centered around effective multimedia practice um, as knowledge construction um, and just pedagogy that has impact um, and, and, and validating that and, and not being afraid to say right what is the specific learning need for these children look at the setting look at the context um, and look at a balanced approach for parents children and staff um, and, and, and provided that you've got a clear direction um, and that it is informed uh, and everyone's contributing to that actually it, it's been an opportunity and it's been harnessing everyone to make sure that we can make great uh, steps forward um, rapidly so i want to pick up on these points particularly um, for, for andrew and charles really where you've got like an, an, a number of schools that are under your your uh, your, your management um, how have you guys dealt with say inertia and sort of like an anxiety around you know, upskilling staff and then parents and then, you know, I'm interested to, to understand Harpy's perspective on this as well. But yeah, there's I, I know that there's a, a lot of call from from schools at the moment where there's like device accessibility issues, perhaps in school, but obviously very much at home. And there's like a somewhat a resistance um, in certain scenarios. Um, and, and I'm just interested to understand like how for primary and upskilling teachers to, to, to be more um, accomplished with tools like classrooms or teams or tapestry or seesaw. How how are you dealing with it? How, how do you deal with that resistance? Um, can I just come in on that? Please. Quite enough. Um, and, and just um, jumping off what Andrew said there about having this research group of, of staff that look at things, that's something that we've implemented in recent times. It sounds like we're a little bit uh, you know, it sounds like um, Andrew's group has gone, uh, you know, much further down the road with that than we have. But it's certainly a very, uh, you know, incredibly valuable way to feed into this conversation about, you know, what works and what doesn't. Um, and um, having those conversations with teachers who are, you know, I'm in the classroom one day a week, having a conversation with teachers in the classroom five days a week and, and, and finding their enthusiasm. Or, or their lack of enthusiasm from trying out a product and saying it was dreadful yeah is is that's absolute gold dust in terms of how you progress and and then how you um cascade that down to the other stuff who might be in uh, that position where they're less um able to see the impact of of that we had a bit of you know yes there was certainly anxiety from staff al along the way um we had a regular open meetings with staff to, to tackle those sorts of issues. Um, CPD webinar sessions um, specifically for beginners, um, but also sort of championing those staff who who really came, came into their own and, and sort of excelled themselves and surprised everyone, including in, including us who are, who are the, you know, more um, 
more adept at using technology. Um, and, and, and so I, I guess there's a matter there as well of sort of providing the initial stage of tools, for example, something like product seesaw and saying, look, you can do this, you can do that, you can do that, and, and leaving it there, you know, here's your 10 minute introduction. Off you go, have a play, use this in, in the classroom environment like we are um, encouraging people to do at the moment and, and see where it takes them. You know, sometimes it's it's kind of the vision that comes from the, the non-tech specialist with the product that ends up being the most important or ends up being the the, the route that most people will be able to to see with it. Yeah, I mentioned this yesterday on the panel to, that um, that actually if you can serve the needs of like, the, the, the least uh, confident of your users, you can turn them into early evangelists very quickly. And then they, you know, they can, you know, really uh, fly the flag and advocate for the change. Harpreet, did you have a view on all this? Um, yes, I just wanted to share just two things. So firstly, um, what we find quite useful is, you know, if there's resistance, sometimes the resistance comes because um, the staff might not understand why it's necessary to do what you're asking them to do. So actually leading with the, the children and saying, oh, we've noticed that, you know, we've had a lot of children doing homework catch up and then on managing their time or they're not uh, very well organized with the homework. What is the solution to this? And then you can then say actually on Google Classroom, you know, if we do this, then this will mean the children can keep up with what they need to do, when they need to do it, when they hand it in. And this will therefore reduce the number of homework catch up, which means staff don't have to stay off school uh, doing running homework catch up sessions. So actually you're doing a, a nice rationale as in, you know, the children are at the heart of this and we really need to make sure we train ourselves so we can best support them to be successful at, in school. Um, yeah, I think that's my key point. I think them trying to understand why it's also it's important, but also, you know, things like Google Forms, it can be really overwhelming trying to learn how to do it and how you, to do it effectively. And there's a lot of buttons that you need to know to press, otherwise you won't collect the right data or not get the email addresses, etc. So actually, you know, thinking about, you know, we need to be data driven. How do we collect data? We might do it in ways that are very uh, unproductive, really inefficient. So how can we speed up these processes? And this is the tool we're giving to actually manage your time much better so you are more free and you're less stressed because you're not spending all your time marking or doing all these things. So A, it's about selling the time saving aspect of technology. It does save time. You just have to put a lot of time initially into upskilling yourself and learning how to do it. But over the long run, that will save you time. So I think if they understand that, then it helps with the buy in and it reduces the resistance. Great. Thank, thanks very much for that insight. And, and Andrew, I guess, you know, any any final thoughts on this topic of building blocks and, yeah. um, and how you're tackling challenges? Yeah, certainly. I, I think um, points that people have already raised, those structures and processes around a bank of how to videos from the ground up that are, that are short, efficient, really informing um, are very useful. Um, but what I'd say is that initial support and setup around safeguarding and security and what have you, confidence uh, around platforms and logistics, once that's it, it there, actually from there it's about harnessing what we're already aware of, um, uh, what we can already do and what we already know. We're, we're experts in teaching and learning as practitioners. Um, we know what engagement looks like. We know how to identify and measure rates of learning um, and that puts people in an informed position um, I think it's the best position to be in to make the right choices for their children and their learning needs. Um, they can make the right decisions. If you have a platform that is versatile um, that, uh, and you don't need a lot of platforms um, that allows variety um, and doesn't inhibit a teacher's skill, if they're easy and efficient to use for staff um, and have great returns on the children's learning, um, an impact on children's learning, then people are away. You know I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're empowered. Um, and, and then that hopefully galvanizes the next steps are, and the, the blocks beyond that, right? That, you know, that they feel that they uh, they have, you know, some autonomy and they don't need to have hand held, hands hold, held uh, to, to then sort of take charge and, and then, you know, uh, expand how they're using it and their, their sort of confidence in using it, right? Um, I, I want to sort of come on to this point around sort of pastoral care in, in the context of sort of the pandemic on the, with the backdrop of sort of remote learning and, and children out, out of school. 
interesting. How, how do you sort of see, you know, how pastoral practices are changing or, or needing to be adapted as a necessity of this, this sort of challenging time? Um, anybody want to want to kick off with that? Yeah. Well, I can kick off and say that, you know, there's there's clearly been, um, I want to say, a, 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 a generally positive experience with doing parents evenings through um, teams or online meetings or what have you. People are, are recognising the efficiency in there um, for both um, parties, teachers and, and parents within that. So that's a great game. Um, it would be it would be um, terrible if that meant that parents didn't ever you know, actually venture onto school sites again, um, mm -hmm. have that experience. But I think, you know, lots of teachers have, have recognised that this is a tool that can can get them through um, those situations in a, in a much better way, generally. Good. And then I guess, you know, to, to Adrian Harper, where where there are maybe some device challenges at home, uh, what, 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 what do you have to say to that, like in terms of how the store might need to change or is changing? Sorry, Chris, could you just repeat that question? Yeah, I was, I was just I was just thinking, sort of picking up on the, the, the point that Giles was making where like so parents evenings seem to be maybe more fluid and dynamic now that people can, uh, you know, zoom in or, or, or jump in from the comfort of their home. This is obviously a shame that they're not going to possibly be on site um, temporarily. But I guess, you know, in the scenarios where um, there, there are limited access to devices, or you know, parents' own sort of skill sets with them um, using technology isn't, um, you know, to, to the degree of like what, what it is in school currently. Like, I mean, have you guys faced any of those sorts of challenges, or um, or you know, just more broadly than that, like the pastoral side of what Reach Academy is able to offer mm -hmm. currently? How, how has that yeah. sort of evolved? So, um, at the moment, so as we're finding that. With, you know, with lockdown and with coronavirus, that some children are in school, um, some aren't, and then sometimes bubbles are being sent home. So we have just found it really useful. Oh, okay. Um, we just found it. Sorry, I, I need to move. Is that okay? And um, I, can, I can jump in there if you like. It's fine. Yeah, I'll come back in a second. So. Um, what I would say is accessibility if they need to have access um, we're in a, a fortunate position to be well resourced uh, and that means that we can support that access and uh, to ensure that um, we have those audits that information around access to the internet and a, and a suitable device and if you've got siblings suitable to multiple devices should it be necessary um, to make sure that actually there are no barriers um, but it is a factor that is unavoidable. We've got to make sure that the children have got access. Yeah, I mean, there, there is, there are obviously still some challenges there, and um, and I guess you know those hard to reach learners from from this context of being able to provide them you know good good pastoral support or providing teachers with you know good pastoral support to reach those children. Um, there, there, there seems to be like yeah that that they. they it is changing right and it doesn't seem like it's going to necessarily go back to uh, the traditional means of, of delivering pastoral uh, support and care um, you know maybe in the future as, as sort of the, these sort of restrictions ease I mean this sort of leads into this next sort of point around um, you know the, the change for good like what, what are we experiencing in, in primary education in terms of how things are changing for you know pro probably to some extent maybe permanently and for, for for the better. Um, have you guys got some some ideas on 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 that in terms of your sort of first hand experience and what you're seeing on the ground? Well, I guess the, the first thing to say is that you know that upskilling of staff um, can only really be a positive thing. It's usually a positive thing. You know, my, before the COVID crisis, um, you know, I often thought to myself, look. Uh, I can do something else and come back to education in 10 years when we when we've kind of jumped a lot of these hurdles you know and, and jumped forward uh, to where I think we should be um, but perhaps this is just this is just a bit of acceleration towards it and and there will be a there will be inevitably a kind of backlash against it in a way um, if we go back to normal circumstances where people kind of some will say, thank goodness that's over and I can, you know, get back in the classroom. I I do think for, for primary, probably the the you know, 
a learning platform or, or, or however we put it, um, is is you know much less of a of a um, impactful thing than let's say university level education, which clearly looking at it, you think, wow, it's got the potential to strip it out and and really kind of revolutionise how people are are going to engage with that. Whereas for me. First day I was back in the classroom with the third, you know, 28 children. There's a sense of you can't recreate this, right? You can't recreate um, what we're doing here in the classroom. And so there's got to be an element of caution about what parts of ed tech are going to impact um, most. What I'm going to say when we're back to normal, not knowing that, <laughs> not knowing the answer to that. But um, it would be a shame for people to get lost down the route of of learning platforms and think, oh, well, that's that's been and gone and we've done that thing. Whereas actually it's 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 the integration of ed tech within classrooms. Yeah. Um, children being able to pick up a device and use it and the teacher say, right, go on to go on to there. I've set you some work in there um, and they, you know, they might be increasing the, their fluency in maths yeah. and the teacher gets some amazing analytics out of it and all those things that for me, are actually way more important than what's been happening in the, in the COVID time in terms of primary and ed tech and, and, and getting, you know, enthusiasm, 21st century skills um, and, and, and saving time for teachers, just, just letting them letting them enter the 21st century finally. Yeah, and I wonder whether, you know, what what we see, and I'm interested to know your opinions on this, whether because of, you know, the scenario and then, you know, the, the upskilling on mass of, of teachers, to use tools or new tools and um, that they were unfamiliar with before. I wonder what, whether this is a catalyst to then over the course of maybe the next couple of years or longer to then introduce other interactive content, other types of rich media, yeah. other types of learning resources that, you know, for, for anybody that's really interested in the ed tech space, there's, you know, there's, there's no shortage of innovation and no shortage of really cool um, interactive content that can be used for for, uh, for 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 teaching and learning, but until now, maybe there's been um, a lack of uptake and adoption because actually we've needed to get the workforce over this these first hurdles of being to understand how these virtual learning platforms and online learning platforms, you know, to their to their fullest, and and now this kind of opens up an opportunity to kind of explore well, what other tools that are useful could be could be used right Andrew have you got any sort of ideas on this yeah what I would say is where I think it is um, really powerful and mindful is that actually that it's not a remote learning approach but actually that it continues into an e-learning approach mm -hmm. um, and actually that there are the benefits that you've just highlighted actually continue on um, when we talk about that permanent change um, I think it's down to us as professionals. I think when we we've, we'll have all seen certain slides and information around um, gaps that might be uh, uh, coming as a result of some remote learning practice um, uh, across the country. Um, but what I would say is we need to know what we're and see what we're doing now. If, if that is in, uh, informed and effective, Mm. That can and leading to a deeper understanding based on uh, effective multimedia practice. Um, actually, multimedia is in the bricks and mortar classroom. I mean, think of the examples, even a whiteboard, talking through and drawing on a whiteboard, standing in front of the interactive whiteboard um, and, and going through your, your, your learning and the session for the children. But beyond that, you've got um, opportunities to record, um, revisit, um, sessions for children. You've also got um, much more engaging, interactive and supportive homework that you can support through some of these platforms. Um, but uh, in the context that we're in at the moment, if we're looking through the lens of multimedia learning, um, it, our responsibility now is to gain that deep understanding. Uh, and then we, when we do go back, um, and it'll be a relief for lots of people, I'm sure, it'll be like putting on slippers, oh, we can go back to normal. I think it's about that awareness 
um, and carrying that awareness with us. Because if we're uh, we're in a position to improve and really close those gaps rapidly and as as efficiently and as effectively as possible, we do need to be aware of what we are doing and um, what's working really well, the, the improvements that we've made, uh, and carry that awareness uh, back into the classroom. Sorry, guys. I don't know what's happening here. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, um, it's something really interesting around, uh, you know, the assessment of learning in and the, these potential new modes of, of, of assessing learning, I think, given, you know, what we're just saying in terms of how primary is maybe changing for good. I guess, you know, maybe there's been a, a reluctance to, to try out new things because assessing learning um, ha has been potentially a challenge. Um, up until maybe recently when, when, when we sort of figuring out how best to do that assessment. Maybe you could start on this, like what, what, what sort of top tips have you got for teachers that are thinking about, you know, um, how they're going about assessing learning and whether it's these, these sort of remote learning scenarios or generating feedback or, you know, producing the, the right sort of data that helps to inform, you know, whether or not the child is, is demonstrating you know, skills development and whatnot. And yeah, I, I'd like to, to get an understanding of what, what we sort of think as being, you know, and uh, good models for assessment. I think um, with assessment, the key purpose of assessment is to be able to identify the gaps in the child's learning. And if, when, if you're doing this just by marking tests and then creating your own gap analysis, Depending on your skill level, that gap analysis can be really effective or it might be ineffective or you might not know how to get the most out of that data. So I think using online platforms that do that for you means that you get all the data that you need and even more. And you can then spend time actually interpreting the data rather than just having to input or um, you know make an Excel spreadsheet and things like that. So I just think with assessment, if you find the right tools online, they can save you a lot of time, but they can also give you really meaningful data that will have an impact um, on the pupils that you're working with. So I think it's, it, you know, it's a very difficult thing, I think, assessment in different schools because people are always doing different things. So it's really nice to talk to different schools, talk about the assessment, um, how they are doing the assessments, how they're recording it, and then how they are using that data effectively. Um, but I do think it saves a lot of time if you have the right means through which you get that data. Um, just, you know, for example. Could you give an example of what you're doing like, and how that's changed? Um, yeah, so, um, so Google Forms is a really easy way just for any subject area to be able to set um, and quiz just to see how the children have performed. So rather than just completing a homework, if they complete the homework and then they have to complete five questions, it's kind of like an exit ticket to see if you've done your homework and you really understood what you did in the homework, then you should be able to answer these five questions. And the data is really quick because you can see what, the, what score they got out of five, which question children struggled with the most. And it means when you come back to school, you can say, you know, I noticed a lot of children got a really low score in this question. Let's go through it. Why was it tricky? What do we not understand? So it just means um, the, the, the data you receive is really useful to then actually address those gaps when you then return to school, but you're not having to do that yourself because computers just telling you automatically how they did. So Google Forms is great and we find it works across many subject areas. It's not specific to just one. Um, and then another website that we've just signed up to is maths.co.uk. So we were using Mathletics previously but we found that this website, it does a gap analysis. So it's very similar to doing a end of year assessment or end of term assessment, which means you can really identify in each child where the specific gaps are and then the whole class where the gaps are. And it gives you all the percentages uh, uh, marked across the year throughout um, against the national curriculum, which is obviously very useful to see what national curriculum objectives they're meeting or not. So I think there's lots of platforms that are really well designed because they match up with national curriculum, but then also do the gap analysis for you so that homework is meaningful because you can use the data to inform your next practice versus just something they do bring in and you said, you know, you've done your homework, great, either you've done it or not, but yeah, versus actually using that data um, I think being more data driven by using these platforms is um, 
a really good example of good practice. And I think that teachers become more data driven if they're using resources like that because it takes away the um, the, the workload. Yeah, and if the workload right. is taken away, then of course teachers have the time to then a look at the data, interpret it, and then make use of it. So I think it does decrease the workload. So yeah, that's yeah. My reflections on that. And, 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 and Andrew Charles, like your your point, uh, your views on maybe this more sort of formative assessment modes or you know uh, you know to the points that Harper was making that actually maybe there's there's opportunities to take some of the the pain away of doing the job um yeah what what, what views have you got on that what I would say is that when we're looking at that um balance of um input and gains from a teacher's time um y yes the platforms um must be able to deliver on that and make sure that actually we can do the thing that matters and that's looking at that making sure we do something with that information so that we can move learning forward um I, I, you may have systems and structures within the your school we use um power bi to pull everything together um and and break things down so actually it's not um uh, a, a process of crunching the numbers actually that information is there and gets the heart of what we want to do and that is move learning forward um what i would say is when we're using that information uh, through remote learning actually the way we're feeding back to children and the, the way that we're able to um, identify the learning needs the platform actually is um brilliant for that it provides a, a host of opportunities from reading that piece of work to the child and, and and talking through and celebrating that i mean think about the distance between you and the child and how powerful that is the feedback we get from parents from children um, is that actually they look forward to that and actually it, it um it does a lot for their well-being their engagement their motivation that interaction that is so crucial um to 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 highlight and and, and input into a remote learning setting yeah, thank, thanks for that, Andrew. Really, really insightful. And what about you, Charles? I just want to make a few points about it. I, I think it's an area of, you know, it's just going to be really rich for, for primary school generally to use automated systems for assessments and um, um, across different subjects. But um, I think there are subjects that lend themselves more to this than others. And the one that stands out to me is maths um, as, a, as the subject that, that can, we can just gained so much from at this point. So I would encourage people to look at those options initially. And the other thing to say is for teachers, um, we can't be asking them to make the content for these quizzes. All right. It might be a case of picking and choosing and adapting, but they need to be like, you know, DJs pulling great things off the shelves, not people who are actually making the resources there. And that's the, you know, I stand by that all the time. Um, we're having said that, we're looking at ourselves as a as a as a group um, of making some assessment questions um, for pre-block in maths assessments and then and then post block and actually putting them in a um, in a system that presents the the you know this assessment test quiz in a, in a, a game environment which they you know they they love doing it and the children pestering me to to you know can we do that again can we do that one again because I really liked anything well that's that's great you know because you're getting we're getting that feedback. Um, so when, when, I just want to hang on to that point a little bit. So the game environment, what, what do you mean by that? Are you talking about like a, a, uh, a, I'm talking about a particular product? It's a, uh, where does it come from? Quizzes. Quizzes. Um, uh, integrates with Google Classroom, uh, but you can just chuck the link somewhere. Um, and it's just that you can hone how it's presented to the children well and they enjoy that. Um, if you're looking at multiple choice questioning though, you have to be aware of things like, well, if I've, I've got four choices, one in full chance, I'm going to get it right. You know, I much prefer when you're six, seven, eight questions there to, to take that out of it. And, and so looking at these resources, there's, there's actually a lot more to it than you sometimes first think in, in terms of how the children interact with that assessment. There's another product we, we use um, in some of our schools at the moment, um, learning by questions, which is really interesting because it produces live feedback as the children are working on their devices. So it's a different way of making it work. And we've got some very infused teachers um, on that, particularly for the science and maths content. Um, English, we weren't so impressed with as it stands. But I guess what I'm saying is this is all this is all coming into fruition now. We've got to 
tread carefully into it and make sure that whatever you say here, you know, 28 schools here, do this, make sure it's fully watertight and it's as you know, it, impactful and insightful as, as possible. Um, because it's not, it, it, you know, there's quite a lot to think about in terms of what is a good maths question? What is a good maths question with multiple choice answers? Um, and certain parts of maths won't lend themselves so well um, to on-screen working and, and computer systems won't be able to um, automatically mark them necessarily, or they might have a fiddly system and child doesn't know how to use it or whatever. So, you know, be opinionated about whether it works well or not. I'd say to listen, I, I'm going to sort of begin to draw to a close now and I've got a final question, which is really I'd like you to, to understand what will be your, your top tips for, for schools that are going through a change right now in terms of, um, you know, what, what, how to best evaluate what, uh, what permanent changes are likely to be made. Now, Andrew, one of the points that you made earlier on is that you're, you're constantly in a continuum of experimentation and some rapid cycle evaluations. So maybe to the, these sorts of points, you could just, yeah, give, give your, your, all three of you your summary of what advice or top tip you would be, be, be offering for uh, how to determine what should stay and what is uh, maybe impermanent? I'll, uh, I might give a, a short, concise answer here. Um, trust yourself, have high expectations, um, and um, if it's having impact, it stays. If it isn't, Look for something else. Look for the uh, something that works for you, works for the children, works for the parents. Simple as that. Great, thank you very much. Short and snappy. Um, Harper or Charles, who wants to chip in next? Um, yeah, I think my top tip is probably to um, do a survey, do a questionnaire, or um, to find out what is it that you know staff need, what they find tricky, what they think is going well because then using the data from the people who are actually the ones that you're trying to support will then uh, guide you into what you need to do to support them to be able to do those things. So asking feedback from surveys from staff and parents and ch children as well, I think is probably the most valuable thing. So you know where to direct your um, support to make sure things move forward. Great, so that, that to me sounds it's not just about a data driven approach to get ones and zeros and a quantitative approach, but it's about empathizing with people's sort of pain points and their motivations and their drivers and what they like and what they don't like. Um, I mean, this lends itself so well to design thinking strategies and actually a lot of the stuff that kind of entrepreneurs go through when they're first building out products. I talk about schools currently right now as being almost like their own little startup hubs because yeah. you are continually experimenting and trying to fail fast without breaking the entire system. Giles, on that on that note, why don't you sort of you know, sort of sign off with, with some other meaningful wisdom that we can all glean? <laughs> uh, I guess what needs to be added into into the mix as well as you know getting all that feedback from your staff trusting trusting that if something doesn't look right for you or maybe it isn't you know don't believe the hype don't believe the sales talk um is that infrastructure is going to be a massive issue for schools if you're expanding the number of devices you've got you need fast internet um if you're hoping to make changes and and hone your system so that they work you need it support that is responsive to that and quick and i hate to say it but generally IT support for schools often come you know talking to teachers they say we've had a bad experience you know and it's going to be tough for people to kind of you know you've got to you've got to forge those relationships and and, and make um, the conversation two-way between the IT support and what's actually going on in the classroom and I think that's a tough call it's a tough call it's, it's something that schools are going to have to try to um, overcome um, yes, schools yeah. having had, had their fingers burnt in the past. I mean, we're in a very different world today compared to where we were just five years ago from a tech perspective. You know, internet is faster. We have more cloud-based approaches. We've got better talk tech that talks to each other. I wonder whether there's something around a Maslow's hierarchy of education needs, <laughs> where this infrastructure layer 
and sort of support and administration kind of is, is the principle. And then you've got something around sort of attitudes and empathising with the people that are using it. And then so somewhere towards the top, there's sort of parents, children and and um, obviously learning outcomes that comes comes, um, you know, as it, it's, a, it's a core part of it. But in order to maybe get this resilience right, it's got to be underpinned by uh, these, these stable and strong foundations. Well, guys, it's been fabulous to talk with you today. Um, I'm really pleased that we've had this chance to get together, share some views, share, share some different perspectives and find sort of common ground in a lot of instances. Um, I, I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Um, why don't we all say goodbye to everybody and um, and thank everybody for being with us today and um, look forward to the next time we get this opportunity to meet.